I talked to some people that knew Katie and I asked advice about how she liked to work and um, I try to do a little bit of research in that way and so I don't go in cold. And what I heard was is that Katie likes to perform for people so make sure that um, the playback isn't too loud so that people can hear her sing and then have as many of her friends and, and don't keep people away. She, she'll be better if she's performing for, for an audience, a, a real audience. One of the things that Harris and I found appealing about shooting on video was that we could see exactly what we were going to get. We didn't have to wait. To me, like, video is information. Film poeticizes what it looks at. Whereas video is very pure, hard information. This is my theory, anyway. And I think it lacks poetry, and sometimes that's what you want. But I haven't wanted it since. It's kind of cool when you take these icons and you don't really treat them with kid gloves. You just you make them look good and, and, and interesting and, and sexy and charismatic. But you can also you know, have another layer going on where you, don't, you, you, you treat them like an actor in a story and whatever's necessary for the story is, is what's required of them. And the fact is that he was you know, just remarkably uh, open and trusting. And I, I explained to him what I wanted to do. I showed him some references. Uh, I pulled a couple of clips from some old movies and said this is sort of the world I wanted to create. And he was like, fine. And at that point he was like, some actors that I've worked with, he's just, you know, I'm, I am yours. Uh, to Tell me where to stand, tell me how you'd like to do this, what you'd like me to do. And, and he did it without any complaint. I'm always trying to understand what makes an image complex and resonant and what makes another image not so, and how, how meaning is communicated in imagery. And then from that point, you know, I went through Irwin's photographs and uh, picked out ones that I thought would suit the song and the Chili Peppers. And I just pretty much came up with a bunch, a list of other ideas. And then my art director, uh, Mike Manson, and Michelle Munoz, they went out shopping and just to see what they could find. And we made like tables and tables of stuff. I mean, we probably could have shot at least five times longer than we had time to do and just tried other things and played around. So it actually was pretty planned out because I only had two days to shoot the video, I think, and I didn't want to just make it a free-for-all of improvisation. Like, I like the idea of shooting in this raw space. I always wanted to shoot a video that had no set, and it had such a, to such a degree it had no set that it was a raw space with cement floor, primer on the walls, those kind of gray doors that aren't painted yet. I always thought that was a really interesting aesthetic. And I thought by placing a band as like wild and primal and kind of sexual as they are in such a kind of banal or a sterile context that it would actually kind of highlight who they were in a nice way. What we tried to do is like have vivid colors in the props and, and keep the clothes and the, and the setting incredibly bland and gray and neutral. I have no idea what it means. Actually, this is probably the, the most wonderfully meaningless video I've ever done. Not that my other ones have any particular special meaning, but this is just pure play. We were just trying to take this idea from Erwin Worm and make it move. We wanted to show the process and we ended up having an incredibly great time. But I'm really happy with the way it came out. I also think it's a really fresh looking video because the idea of shooting in this raw space with blank white walls and cement floors is so antithetical to the way most videos are approached. They're usually approached with, well, let's make the most interesting or flashy or slick or elaborate set. And the whole idea here was, let's make it as uninteresting as we possibly can and let, make what's going on in this world really interesting. There are kind of two ideas that came together that resulted in the concept for uh, the Lincoln Park video. One was I had seen a videotape uh, of an Alexander McQueen fashion show from like long time ago, it was like 1993. They had this bank of lights facing the models. In some of the shots, you know, you can see the lights glaring into the camera and you saw the silhouette of the model and this sort of just the, the silhouettes of the backs of the heads of all these people in the crowd. And I thought, I just registered that as very interesting. It seemed like the theme of the song is don't ignore me. So I felt like this very simple idea of let's never show the band's face. Let's create this kind of tension and suspense where we're behind them, we're behind them, and that anyone watching the video is probably going to say, 
well, when are we going to see their faces? And so I thought that would engage a viewer in a different way where it starts to become like, well, what's going on here? Are we going to be behind them the whole time? And I knew that there was a good moment in the song that was very kind of epiphanous where I could turn around and do a 180 and finally see their faces and acknowledge them. I've been very, I mean, I've been very lucky in my career. I haven't had a lot of strife or problems with bands or conflicts or disagreements, but the potential for disagreements are increased when you have four or five guys in, in a band. I was a little nervous because there were so many guys and because Joe had directed all the videos previously, but I, I will tell you these were the nicest guys I've ever worked with. I mean, I have to say I really, really wanted to do a rap video just because I'd never really done one. And I also felt like most rap videos are kind of samey. It's probably the most vital genre of music going on in pop culture right now and the least vital music video culture. So I really wanted to take a shot at making a, a, a rap video. So Rick put me on the phone with Jay-Z and uh, I said, you know, what are you thinking? And he said, I just want to shoot something about where I grew up, but I don't want it to look like other rap videos. I want it to look like art, which is kind of general. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? He goes, well, you know how, you know, a photographer can just take some wall where bums piss and, and somehow he makes it look like a painting. And I said, I want to do that with where I grew up. And I went, I think I could do that. We did really deep location searching all through the kind of the fringes and the deep pockets of Brooklyn. And uh, I, I was just looking for stuff that felt raw and rock and roll and transgressive but was still connected to black culture and that you don't, stuff you don't normally see in a, in a rap video. Because I never felt like I was making a rap video. I felt like I was making a rock video that had rapping in it. So I think that just gave it a different kind of strategy where I just said, yes, it's a rap track, but I'm not, I'm, let's give it a rock, rock energy. And uh, you know, there was a derelict prison that we shot in, which was a really oppressive, depressing place to be in. And I had seen an image, which I also think was a South African image of a row of black men lined up uh, naked with their hands against the wall. And I said, you know, that's exactly the kind of image that I want in this video. MTV will never show it, but it's an image of oppression and it's, it's transgressive and it's hardcore and it's, and I just put it together and kind of recreated something like that image and then other things around it. This was a really intuitive video. I mean, the, this Fiona Apple video, it was this whole idea of taking the aesthetic of snapshot photography and exploring it as cinema, as in motion. I was looking at some of Nobuyushi Araki's photographs, who's a, a Japanese sort of snapshot style art photographer, but the rest of it was just kind of like, just stuff. I don't, it's meant to, you know, I like when things kind of have an enig enigmatic or puzzle kind of quality where you're not really sure what's going on, but you're engaged. Everyone says it looks like surveillance, and it does look like surveillance, and it just gives a quality to the camera motion that's odd that gives it a kind of alienated, paranoid kind of quality because it looks like a security camera. The fact is though that that idea didn't come from anything about security cameras or anything. It came from really liking the films of the Brothers Quay and their animated films. And so the camera movement in their films is also animated, so they'll move the camera frame, move the camera frame. So it has this very staccato kind of and it stops on like a dime. And I always thought, wow, that's a really cool way to move the camera. I was very emboldened at that time to just say, well, I'm not that interested in the restrictions that MTV is putting on, on things. I'd like to treat these as little works of art that are just poetic films to music. And I know that we're here for commercial reasons. I know that we're here to market artists and sell more CDs and everything, but there's no sense of kind of rebellion or rock and roll sensibility left anymore. It's getting sucked out of all this stuff and MTV is this funnel where everything is, it all comes down to what MTV thinks. And I started to develop this attitude and it started with Closer, I think, and of the Nine Inch Nails video and this video where it's like, I'm just going to film what I want. And if it's too much for MTV, then we'll discuss it and we'll pull it back. Maybe we'll blur it, maybe we'll censor it, but I don't want to start off pre-censoring it, which was a really liberating thing. And uh, this was also happening hot on the heels of the big controversy of that Calvin Klein underwear campaign that was sort of influenced by uh, Larry Clark's pictures and uh, that's when the shit kind of was hitting the fan. This video happened to come out right around that time and you know I was just influenced by 
that snapshot fashion photography, which was really kind of popular at the time. People like Jurgen Teller and Wolfgang Tillman. And when I was listening to the song, I kept thinking about, well, what am I going to do with this perfect drug thing? Like if, you, like if Madonna sends you a song and she's singing Rain, 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 you have to deal with the rain. Even if you don't want it to be literal, you are going to have to attend to it. And I felt the same way with this one, perfect drug, perfect drug, what's the drug? And I think I just glanced over at my bookshelf and I saw Edward Gorey and something clicked. And I went, wow, wow it's, it might be very interesting to make that sort of gothic, almost tongue-in-cheek, theatrical piece. And it occurred to me immediately that Trent would look very kind of dashing in uh, Edwardian clothing. So then I said, well, what, what am I going to do with the perfect drug? And because I was thinking in terms of the 19th century, the idea of absinthe came to mind. One of the things I wanted to do in this video, too, is I wanted Trent to go wild. I felt like I had restrained him in the closer video in comparison to what he does on stage. So the scenes in that hedge maze and the scenes in the pool of water, I just told him to just go crazy and splash and you know, flail about and don't worry about breaking anything or getting anything wet. He actually really soaked the camera. I like the idea of this, the whole video being sort of purple and lavender and very the opposite of all the minimalism that I had explored. This was, in a way, a sort of a maximalism in the sense that it was filled with rich textures. All of Edward Gorey's drawings are wide master tableau, so when it came time to create coverage of a gory image, we really had no references anymore, and I got kind of stuck because it stopped looking like Edward Gorey when it, when it was in close-up or a medium shot. I like to have a broad range of I guess fauna in in my video, meaning I like to have old people and young people and um, different ethnicities and animals represented, in some cases even uh, insects. But it sounds goofy, but I do like to kind of represent a spectrum of our experience. There was just a look that I wanted to try to get with Lance Acora, the cinematographer, this kind of, we used um, black and white reversal, which is a very slow film. It has an enormous amount of silver in the, in the emulsion, which is what makes it so beautiful. It was all about having this humanity and energy and actually trying to make it look a little fucked up. I liked you know, shooting through things. And One of my favorite shots is of the, the drummer shooting through the windshield of the dirty windshield of the car. And It's a great edit. It's a really fantastic edit by uh, Robert Duffy. I mean, I think that's one of the things. It's like easy to say, well, we'll just go out with a Bolex and shoot some stuff, but it's this edit that just makes it kind of come alive. I try to embrace accidents, but it's not my forte. And this one I say, well, it's going to all be an accident. It's all going to be, I didn't plan anything. I just said, let's just shoot in this area. The whole plan of this video for me was to just be loose. I really wanted this experience of like, how much can you let go and still have it be totally your own? I had gotten pegged as the guy you couldn't afford. People wouldn't even approach me because they say, oh, he's too expensive. And it's like, but that's not true. I want to do all sorts of filmmaking. I can make this huge Michael Jackson video, and I can make this little thing on a Bolex. And I really like this song, and I like this band. And I said, I need to prove to people that I can make an affordable music video that's still really good. So that video was shot in a day. Uh, it was made for about $75,000, which to some people maybe is still a ton of money. I didn't want to get pigeonholed, so that wasn't the main reason for doing it. The main reason for doing it was I liked the song and I had I, I liked this this world I wanted to kind of create. It's just sort of the 60s aesthetic, really, some sort of weird 50s, 60s, almost like Brooklyn aesthetic, which is something that I did not live or experience, but felt a romantic attraction to from a lot of books I had read. And I, I just love the photography of uh, Danny Lyon and Bruce uh, Davidson and wanted to see if I could get that quality on film. And it's actually one of my favorite videos. This is the least expensive video I ever made and I think it's one of the better things I've ever done. And This was something that was really just done for fun.